What if you could learn to see the things that others miss? I call that non-obvious thinking, and in this session, I'll teach you how to do it. My name is Rohit Bhargava, and for the last 10 years, I've been curating a book called Non-Obvious Megatrends. And in this book, I've talked about the biggest trends shaping our culture and business and how we buy, believe, and sell just about anything. And one of the biggest questions people ask me is, how do we think about trends in the future now in a time of total disruption? What I thought I'd do is start off with a couple of visuals to try and paint a picture of what that future looks like. The first one is something called an experience tube, which really got popular last year. And it was based on all of these people who were looking at technology, separating us and saying, I just need a chance to go one on one with someone else. And the experience tube was the answer. Now, during a pandemic, obviously, this probably isn't that good of an idea. So things started to shift and we started to just not know what to pay attention to. And we got angry. And so we started putting public punching bags out because if we could at least release our anger through these punching bags, maybe that would be a good thing. And then we eventually moved to just not knowing what to do at all and, and uh, not seeing any solution for anything. And I love this particular creation because it sort of sums up 2020. I mean, if there was a visual that could sum up 2020, this kind of seems like it would be it, doesn't it? But what if we could better understand today by seeing what's missing and testing ourselves. And in fact, that's one of the first things I'd like to do in this talk, which is give you a super quick test. And in this test, I'm going to share with you three media stories. And I want you to decide for yourself individually whether each one is real or fake. So decide for yourself. This is going to be a very quick test, uh, sort of like a game show. The first story is chemical in McDonald's fries could cure baldness. That's the first story. Second story, bumblebee vomit. Scientists are no longer ignoring it. And the third story, sassy seal accidentally slaps man across face with an octopus. So those are your three stories. And your task is to decide which ones of those are true and which ones are false. Are you ready? Let's see the answers. First story, real. How? Because apparently some scientists found that a chemical could regrow hair and some online writer did a Google search and found that that chemical was present in McDonald's fries. Put the pieces together. There's your story. Sadly, this is not true. I did try it. It doesn't work, unfortunately. So I don't recommend it. However, the story is real. Second real story, sassy seal accidentally slaps man across face with an octopus. Yes, this is real. And in fact, I will give you a URL where you can watch this video because it is, as you would suspect, highly entertaining. The third big story, bumblebee vomit, scientists are no longer ignoring it, is also real. So one of the things that you realize when you look at these stories is it's hard to tell what's real and what's fake. And in fact, all of these books that were recently published kind of talk about the same thing, which is that we're in the midst of what I call a modern believability crisis. And this believability crisis is affecting everything from how we see the world to how we put the pieces together for what we choose to believe and what we don't. Because Evian is naive spelled backwards. So like, are we being pranked? Are we being faked? Uh, can we even tell? And how would we tell? Maybe it's just donut seeds. Maybe it's just a good pitch. And eventually we might figure out that, yeah, these are Cheerios. But we, it's, it's hard to know the difference because so many messages and stories that we see out there are not meant to make us feel good about ourselves. In fact, kind of the opposite. The images are retouched to make us feel worse about ourselves in many ways. I mean, here's a real fashion ad that says hotness comes in all shapes and sizes. And then it shows you four women who are basically the same size. So Hotness comes in all shapes and sizes, but it kind of comes in one size, according to this ad. And how does that make us feel, uh, whether we're the target audience for the ad or not? Because we see all of these misleading claims and all of this media out there, and it seems unbelievable. I mean, Cocoa Krispies, all natural. How is that possible? Is there a tree that grows this uh, cereal that we haven't seen out there? Of course not. And so every time we see one of these, it reduces our faith in the truth just a little bit. And we just don't know what to pay attention to. And so this major challenge emerges of how do we pay attention and navigate through the noise. Now, what doesn't work is just scrolling through everything. Because when we try and scroll through everything, we essentially choose to try and be speed readers. 
And yes, there are some apps and tools like this one that promise to allow you to be a better, faster reader. And you might look at something like this and say, man, that's, that's, that's great. Or you might think to yourself, I already feel like I have a major headache. But the point of this is not to try and consume everything because you can't get smarter by trying to consume everything. It doesn't work. It would be a bit like if you were really, really hungry and instead of going and having a proper meal, you chose to go and compete in a hot dog eating contest. How would you feel after that? I mean, you wouldn't be hungry, but you definitely wouldn't feel good either. And it's a perfect visualization for what happens to us a lot uh, that many people have called infobesity, which is this idea that we just have so much information coming in that we're literally stacked up with it. And we just don't know what to pay attention to. And instead of doing that, what if we could do what Isaac Asimov, one of my favorite writers, said he does when he thinks about the information he consumes, when he thought about uh, the information he would consume, which is not to be a speed reader, but to be a speed understander. What if we could be speed understanders? What would that look like? How would we use that skill? How would we develop that to be able to find the non-obvious thinking to anticipate what's going to happen next for the future and better prepare ourselves? Whether we have our own companies or whether we work for someone else, no matter what we do, if we could train ourselves to see those things, we could be better. We could see what others miss. And that's what I teach people with this method that I call non-obvious thinking. And it comes down to five essential mindsets of non-obvious thinkers. Be curious, be observant, be elegant, be thoughtful, and be fickle. Each one of these has a little bit of a different description here. And you can see those descriptions uh, written down on this particular slide. But ultimately what it comes down to is being very, very intentional about the habits and things that you choose to do and what you choose to pay attention to when you are consuming media. And for me, what this process eventually leads to is bringing all of these ideas together into trends. And what I thought I'd do, instead of just showing you some static visuals, is I thought I'd show you a video to take you behind the scenes of how this actually looks for me. So what you're seeing here is a time-lapse video of the entire process for curating trends. I'm slowly gathering lots of different materials and information. I'm pulling the pieces together to be able to see how all of those fit together. And I'm starting to uh, anticipate every single trend and all of the different pieces of the puzzle to fit them uh, together in a way that would actually uh, resonate for me and for others. So let me actually pull this full screen. We're doing this live, so we have a slight variation. OK, here we go. So uh, full screen, what you see me doing here is uh, cutting through all of the different stories, grouping them together based on different theories, different elements. And each one of these elements then ladders up to a bigger theme, which start to aggregate together. And part of the process here is to aggregate these themes together into big ideas. And for me, these big ideas become trends, non-obvious trends. In this case, a trend that I called truthing, which was seeking the truth for yourself. Then it turns into an outline eventually, and that outline turns into a chapter in the book. And really what, what this allows me to do is, um, let me fast forward here. There we go. It allows me to uh, put together what has been an annual project for me, an annual book uh, every year where I list out the most interesting and non-obvious trends of the year. And Non-Obvious Megatrends is my latest version of that book, which just came out uh, in January. Now, that seems like a long time away, uh, especially because it was before the pandemic. And so one of the biggest questions is, okay, you wrote a book all about trends for the next decade, and then the pandemic hit. So how has that changed your thinking on so many different things? And what made it even more complex for me is that this was the final time that I was doing this book. This is the 10 year anniversary of this entire project. And I wanted to leave the project at that 10 years because I'm moving on to several things, including a very big announcement that I'll make at the end of this presentation. So stay tuned for that. But ultimately what I wanted to do was take you behind the scenes of not just the method behind this, but also what are the actual trends. And one of the ways we visualized it, which was very entertaining, was this photo shoot from a, uh, a article that a team at Microsoft did about my process where we'd wanted to visualize really the noise that happens 
that we need to conquer, that we need to get past. And this is me covered head to toe in post-it notes. It's not Photoshopped. It's actually me. And uh, this was a really fun way of illustrating that there's just a lot of noise that we have to be able to get past in order to spotlight what the trends are, what the real meaning is behind how the world is changing. So up until now, I've given you a little bit of a background into how I think about non-obvious thinking, the habits that I suggest for non-obvious thinkers. But now I want to get really, really tactical and talk about some of the trends that I spotlighted from the research, as well as some stealable ideas for how you can use each one, because I don't believe that it's enough to just academically think about or look at a trend. I think it's important to say, well, okay, if we understand this trend and we understand how the world is shifting, how would we, what would we do? Like, how would we change what we do in order to pay attention to that? And the first trend I wanted to share with you is something I call the human mode. And the human mode is this idea that when we're tired of the technology that isolates us from one another, we seek out and place greater value on physical, authentic, and unperfect experiences delivered by humans. Now, we're in a time where it's really hard to have those physical experiences delivered by humans because we're separated from one another. But there's many ways to bring more humanity into the projects and things that we do. So here's an example of a team from Herbal Essences that decided to remodel an element of the shampoo and conditioner bottle and essentially put little dots or lines on the back that you could feel because then visually impaired people could decide uh, when they're in the shower, they could see which one, which bottle is the shampoo and which one's the conditioner. Beautifully empathetic design and hugely useful for not just people who are visually impaired, but anyone who has their eyes closed in the shower, which is literally everyone. So sometimes we innovate in a human way and an empathetic way, and it becomes valuable for everyone. And it's so valuable because it's based on the human mode. Another one of my favorite examples is this banana slicer from Amazon, which you may not be familiar with, but is one of the best selling kitchen appliances on Amazon and has been rave reviewed by thousands of people, including reviews such as this one that says, does this work better on Brazilian bananas better than ones from Italy? To which someone says, I would be happy to help if you could be more precise. Are we talking about Tuscany bananas or Neapolitan bananas? Be specific. Lots and lots of reviews just like this about this banana slicer because you know what? Actually, the, the, the number one most helpful review says this banana slicer saved my marriage and raves about how amazing the banana slicer is. And of course, as with every product, not everybody loves this banana slicer. There's some negative reviews. And the negative one-star review, the top-rated negative one-star review says, this banana slicer does not work, in all caps, of course, because this person is really angry. This banana slicer does not work. And then underneath it says, all my bananas curve the opposite direction. <sighs> Clearly people are having a fun time with this banana slicer. But there's a moral of this story too, which is the less seriously we can take ourselves and the more personality we can allow ourselves to have with what we sell, the more people can connect with it. And this banana slicer is a perfect example of that because like people don't need a banana slicer, but it's a fun product and it sells because it's a fun, fun product and because they're unafraid to let humans have a personality and, and, you know, kind of make a joke out of it. I actually buy my banana slicers wholesale because when I do lots of these different events, I send them to people as gifts. So I have an entire wholesale account just for banana slicers. Yes, clearly I am, I'm very weird, but I like doing it. The stealable idea behind this is how do we have a personality with all of our things that we put out into the world? How do we lead with empathy? That's the lesson here. That's the thing that we should try and figure out. Second non-obvious megatrend I wanted to share with you is flux commerce. And flux commerce is my description for this idea that the lines that used to exist between industries are starting to break down. So you've got Apple, a technology mm -hmm. company that is launching a credit card. You've got Capital One having uh, cafes and, and, and spaces for people to gather and work. Crayola, known for their markers, branched out into makeup and making an entire makeup line. Because makeup's basically painting your face. Taco Bell opened up a hotel chain. Uh, you can get a mattress delivered to you in a box. This has been around for quite some time now. You can go to certain Whole Foods locations and have a produce butcher cut, chop your vegetables for you so you don't have to do that yourself. In fact, you can get an oven, a smart oven, that will 
use cameras to decide how long to cook something. So you just stick it in the oven and it cooks itself. And by the way, there's also a device to allow you to hover over food so you can tell if your food has gone bad or not because we are unable now to use the device on our face anymore for that. We need like devices entirely. All of this disruption that's out there. In fact, we don't have patience to wait for things anymore either. This is whiskey that's aged for as little as two days. Because you know what, like we've seen the news about uh, climate change, like we don't know if we've got another 20 years or 30 years to wait for this whiskey to really mature. We may as well drink it now after two days, right? It kind of makes sense. We want to get this, we want to get it <laughs> right now. We want instant gratification. We don't have to go, this is an app um, called uh, Filled where you don't have to go and get your car filled uh, at the gas station anymore. You just park it, use the app in certain regions and it, the truck will come to your car and, and fill it for you. All of this ultimate convenience. We even have human companionship through what uh, in this Japanese company's estimation is called the holographic wife. Um, so now you can get a holographic wife too for companionship. Maybe a bit extreme, but the idea here is all of this disruption points to the fact that we need to start thinking about how are we going to disrupt ourselves? How are we going to disrupt our business and how we work so that we can start to take advantage of all of these opportunities? Third trend I want to share with you is what I call revivalism. Revivalism is based on this modern believability crisis that I talked about earlier. And when we feel like we don't know what to believe, many of us start retreating backwards into the things that we used to know and what we used to pay attention to and what we used to love. So now we're listening to music on vinyl again. Kodak started making film for diehard photographers. All of these uh, entertainment kind of... Uh, uh, entire franchises are coming back, like Star Trek with uh, Sir Patrick Stewart playing Picard again, which is a fabulous show, uh, He-Man, which really wasn't good the first time around. I mean, let's be honest, but that's coming back too. And Josh Gad bringing all these actors back together to do re uh, script reads of The Princess Bride or Back to the Future or like any of these different old school productions. I mean, Cobra Kai is back if you've been watching that. Uh, with uh, with the Karate Kid. And so like all of these are examples of go taking these things that used to be old school and bringing them back. I mean, puzzles are having a huge comeback. Even this diabolical one from Heinz, which is all pieces of the same color, which is just plain evil. I mean, why would you do that? Really, Heinz, come on, why? But we're playing classic video games again too. We're playing board games again too. And all of these things uh, point to the idea that we are now rediscovering the analog. We're rediscovering the beauty of being in this situation where we can remember what we used to do and what we used to play with in the past. And that is a uh, really interesting opportunity for any of us to start to reconnect with what we used to do in our companies in the past. And the last trend I want to share with you is what I call instant knowledge. And instant knowledge is the expectation more and more that we have access to everything at our fingertips, every piece of information. And, you know, sometimes this is not necessarily a good thing. So here's an example of a map that a Google map recommendation uh, that I received when I was driving down the road a couple of months ago. And what it says is you could go straight or you could go in a complete U-turn and waste 36 minutes of your life to then go the same direction you were already going. And that's our that's a perfect example of our expectation right now, which is we expect every option to be presented to us today, even the idiotic ones. And that's a major challenge for all of us because do we really want that many options? Do we want to give people that many options? But that's the expectation because we can learn anything and we can get access to anything faster than ever before. We have these tasty cooking videos that we can watch that allow us to get smart about how we're going to make dinner and what we're going to make for dinner. There was an eight-year-old who taught himself how to drive on YouTube because he wanted to go to McDonald's to get a burger. That is terrifying as a dad of kids. Like that's terrifying, but that's the world we live in. It even inspired us at the non-obvious company to create a series of guides, of how-to guides, because people expect to learn things faster now. And so the old school dummies guides that are 400 pages long, where there's three pages describing to you what a friend is on Facebook, like nobody needs that anymore. We're, we're too smart for that. We need smart advice for smart people. And so we expect that the advice that we get in the places that we get it from is going to tailor itself to that. 
And really, that's the expectation now that is a huge opportunity for many of us in business, which is how do we help people get faster, get smarter faster? And in many many ways in marketing, in the marketing world, at least, this is called content marketing, right? We deliver answers to questions. We deliver solutions. And therefore, people understand that. And they say, oh, you can help me. And what all of these pieces come down to is essentially a reminder of my favorite quote, the quote I shared from Isaac Asimov before, which is, if we are going to be able to take all of these pieces and all of this noise and figure out what we should be paying attention to and do it in such a way that allows us to anticipate the future, we need to be speed understanders, not speed readers. And that is the key. So I promised you all of those things. And I also said that I would be giving you a big announcement. And so my big announcement is uh, my brand new book, which I am very excited to be writing with my good friend, Henry Mason, who uh, comes from the world of trend watching and is a fellow trend curator called The Future Normal. And if you go to this URL right here, you will be able to not only download all of these slides and watch all of the videos that I mentioned in this talk, but you will also be added to our list to get a sneak peek of The Future Normal as we start to develop chapters of the book and different elements, and you'll be really part of our inside circle. So if any of those things seem interesting to you, I would love to have you as part of our community over there. I hope this has been useful for you. And the final thing I will leave you with is one last picture from that photo shoot, along with a way to get in touch with me directly. So this is my personal email address right here. And you can get in touch with me directly by sending me an email, or you can go to this landing page we have set up just for you to be able to download fascinating, interesting materials and to get a sneak peek at our new upcoming book. So now I look forward to talking further uh, with all of you, to having a live engaging session and uh, to getting deeper into any of these trends or non-obvious thinking or what the future normal is actually going to be like. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for listening. And thank you to Inc. for inviting me for part of the event.